to our May associate board meeting. Thank you so much. I see many people here who are not on the associate board. That makes us very excited. Um, so as you all know, we are welcoming our staff and um, board of directors and our technical advisory committee members all to join in these calls once a quarter where we have staff members um, giving presentations about the work that's happening around the world. Um, so welcome everyone who's on the call today. Thank you so much for making the time to be here and be part of the conversation. Um, and also huge thank you to Samuel Schlesinger, sorry, Sam, um, who many of you know, um, he's been with the organization, ooh, I don't know for how long, for maybe eight years, nine years? I think we're coming up on nine. Nine years, yeah. Um, doing amazing work in Ecuador and across Latin America. He is our water and sanitation lead. So he's really leading the charge and thinking about um, the way that green empowerment is approaching our work in the water sector. Um, and that goes from anything, everything from mentoring our other team members in Latin America to um, traveling to Uganda last year and really being part of the partnership with the Water Trust that um, brought our first the first broader project the Green Empowerment has been part of in Uganda, which many of you saw in the film. Um, he also is the staff member who's been working in the Rio Cayapas. So if you did have already gotten a chance to see our documentary, um, those two communities, or one, one of the communities is a community that, excuse me, <clears throat> one of the communities featured in the film is Pichiaku, this amazing Chachi community in the Rio Cayapas. The other community featured in the film is Nayaka Bale in Uganda. So Sam is deeply heavily involved in the work in the Rio Cayapas, and he's going to be presenting on that today. And he also played a really important role in the work um, in Uganda as advisor and collaborator. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to you, Sam. Thank you so much for that introduction, Micah, and a couple of caveats to start off. Um, first, my apologies for not appearing on screen. My jungle internet here in China is not always the best. And second, uh, I had a root canal this afternoon, so getting a little uh, Novocaine wearing off here. So please let me know if anything comes out garbled. Um, okay. So with that, if you want to kick it off, Mike, with the presentation. Sure. Let's figure that Thanks out. So. Here we go. Fantastic. So we're we'll talking a little bit with you all today, as Micah mentioned, about one of the communities we saw uh, in the documentary as sort of an exemplary part of what we're doing with green empowerment and our work on micro utilities in WASH. So while I imagine just about everyone on the call is familiar with green empowerment's model, I want to really highlight how our model links to the work we're doing as a WASH program across Latin America. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've really look to focus in on our water and sanitation programming here in the region, uh, seeing as that's the sort of greatest need, right? A lot of the countries in Latin America are much more heavily electrified than they are in the other continents where we're active. So we're currently active in six countries across the region. And really how we see our model working is first, this idea of community-based management plus, <coughs> plus signifying a little bit of support outside the community. And really seeing how that's driven high sustainability. Uh, Milade funded study back in 2019-2020 showed that 97% of the systems that Green Empowerment has built with various partners over the years are still functioning, right? So really, really seeing how that community management is driving long-term success of these systems. Another aspect is, of course, local implementation, right? These are partners. These are communities doing the work. And that not only empowers the people who are then maintaining these systems 10, 20 years later, but also really reducing costs, right? We're not always hitting it, but our goal across the program is really keeping external investment to under $100 per person. And we feel very proud of that. And finally, of course, that these are high quality wash projects, right? This is the same level of service that you would expect um, in many urban areas across Latin America, and in fact, better than what we see in many urban areas in terms of quality. So really seeing that that big difference, that big depth of impact as people really not only get clean water, but get all of the benefits for their quality of life that comes with having piped water showing up to your house, not having to filter your drinking water independently. <clears throat> so in the Kyopas, next slide, please. A little bit about our partner here. I think we're lacking a little something. There we go. So a little bit about our local partner, Altropico, who is featured in the documentary. Altropico is an Ecuadorian NGO. Um, 
coming up on 30 years of organizational existence, maybe 35 <laughs> plus, counting their other work, and works really, as you can see in this map, along the ecuador colombia border, that uh, squiggly line there running uh, between the two green areas is the border itself. And so working with indigenous Afro-Ecuadorian, Afro-Colombian, and Mestizo communities on both sides of the border, um, they've really had a really fantastic impact with an initial focus on conservation and livelihoods, and then increasingly on complementary activities, or rather on activities that they really feel can leverage their prior work on conservation um, and on livelihood creation. So Altropico has been active in the Cayapas, communities featured in the film, for over 15 years, initially on conservation work, convinced communities that the government's pay for conservation program, Socio Bosque, was not a scam of any kind. It was not a government effort to seize their land, but was really an honest offer of pay for conservation. And since then, has maintained really great linkages with communities in the area. And so that's been a, a very strong point of entry for us as we start the WASH program in that area. The other area that we'll be talking about a little bit is in the lower left of this map, Muizne. Oh, same, oh, sorry. Uh, quite all right. Muizne. Other direction there. Hmm. Is it? Hmm. Back one more, I think. There we go. So on the lower left of that map, still the same province of Esmeraldas, right? This is the northwestern coast of Ecuador, but uh, much different communities. Um, not quite so much river access, but in some ways, a very similar situation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so while we've been... Next slide, please. Oh, it's just lagging a little, Sam. Oh, my apologies. So while we've been working with Altropico since late 2014, early 2015, our work on water really started with Altropico in 2016, after the earthquake in April. So that work began in Wisne right, in Southern Esmeraldas, where the epicenter of that earthquake was. And since then, over the last eight years, we've been able to reach over 19 communities, more than 5,500 individuals, right, everyone receiving that same high-quality household water access. A lot of this work, as I mentioned, has been in communities that participate in Sociobosca in this pay-for-conservation program. And we've also, as you might have noticed on the map, been working around conservation areas, both the Cotacache Cayapas National Park, which is the REC, and the Machu Chindul Nature Reserve, which is that large green area that was on the lower part of the map on the last slide. Why do we prioritize these areas? One, very high poverty rates, uh, very high childhood malnutrition and stunting rates, but also a real lack of water access. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The uh, parishes, right, the sub-county groupings where we're working, are very small populations, right, over very extensive uh, land masses. They're young, right, growing populations, and the state has really failed to get water access into these areas. You can see these coverage levels from 2010 are effectively statistical errors. Someone who had a, a pipe running to their house and the surveyor decided that counted as pipe water access. However, you've seen in these four parishes where we've been most active, effectively all of the statistical change over this 13-year period between national census is due to the work of Altropico with Green Empowerment. So we are quite proud of these advances in each of these parishes um, and proud to see it happening in a context where coverage rates at the county level are actually in some cases declining, right? State investment is not keeping up with population growth or existing systems are failing even um, as, as the years pass. So really looking to focus in on these areas where water coverage is a real problem, where poverty is very high, where the combination of poverty and poor water access is causing health impacts. But of course, this has some comfort, right? This, implies some complications. The idea that these communities are not going to get a lot of support from the state after the fact. The idea that there's not much of an enabling environment for this work. So going into a little more detail, next slide please. Talk to you all about Pichiyaku, right? About the one of the two communities that's starring in the film. 
So it's the Chachi indigenous community. The Chachis are a ethnic group here in northwestern Ecuador that numbers perhaps total 3,000. The community of Pichiyaku then, right, with its 750 residents representing a large portion of that population. And the project was, um, despite maybe the what was painted in the documentary, relatively cut and dry, relatively quick process. Prior to the project, like most communities along the river, <clears throat> Community members were gathering water in buckets from the Kayapas. Community, and that brings a lot of problems. The Kayapas not only the means of transport to all the upstream communities, 40, 50 of them, but it's also where people are throwing a lot of their garbage and where a lot of people's wastewater is running to when it comes out of their bathroom, if they have that luxury. Um, additionally, as mentioned in the documentary, there's illegal gold mining upstream of the Kayapas on several of the tributaries. And so heavy metals contamination and even in the best case, turbidity contamination from those mining operations is a serious problem for families downriver. People report getting hives, skin breakouts, uh, vaginal infections, other issues just from using the river water to do laundry or to bathe in. And as you might imagine from a big community like Kichia, right? While people continue to gather water, previous efforts, next slide please. <clears throat> Right, We're not the first people to show up to Pichiyaku with the idea of a water project. Uh, many of the communities along the Rio Cayapas have had failed prior efforts. Many of these systems have only worked for a handful of months prior to uh, shutting down. And in Pichiyaku, in fact, they've had two prior efforts. The tank that's here on the lower right was initially much further up the hill. They had an effort where I don't think uh, if their, their recollection is correct, water didn't even make it to the tank. So using a piece of logging equipment, they actually pushed it several hundred meters down to its current location where they had a couple of start and go efforts using gas powered pumps to run water up to this tank and distribute it to a very limited number of houses down the hill. No treatment, very high operating costs, very frequent failures. So this was not really considered a water system by the community. This was a, a series of stop and go efforts that occasionally provided water. And this goes to say, right, I don't think there's there's a ignorance of sort of the issues of water access in these areas, but there's been a lot of challenge by both the state and other NGO actors in finding really lasting solutions to this problem or low-cost solutions to these problems in these communities where the uh, dominant surface water source has so many contamination problems. So, next slide, please. How is our intervention model different? Right? How are we proposing something, something that's going to change this reality for the community? First, really, not only the definition of the need is coming from the community, but they're demonstrating that need by being able to put up counterpart funding, right? both all of their labor and, in many cases, cash. Second is we're really assuming that the community is going to have to go its own on, on this management, that we're not going to be able to depend on municipal government or other state interventions in order to keep the system up. And that means that we need a much stronger administrative system, a much clearer system of payments, <clears throat> and a sort of a much more important projection with the community that the initial building is not the difficult part of the project, that running the water system successfully for the next 10, 20, 30 years is a real challenge, and that that's what we need to be thinking about from day one. <clears throat> So we really feel the community is the best position to do this. Um, and we see that interest and we see sort of the the respect and the recognition of Atropico's ability to do this work elsewhere in the community's willingness to um, overcome the doubts caused by these previous failed efforts and say, no, we're willing to invest this time. We're willing to put in all our work. We're willing to really uh, change the paradigm here so that we can improve water access in our own community. Next, so in particular, in Pichiaco, how does that work? The community sends a, a sort of an official document, right? Lots of signatures, lots of seals on it, requesting the support of Altropico. Altropico returns to them a, a list of sort of requirements, right? A list of organizing requirements to get on the waiting list <laughs> and make sure the community understands what these commitments entail. The community, after completing that initial uh, series of requirements, we complete a system design. The community, we set a co-investment amount for the community. In the case of Pichiyaku, local government offered to help pay that amount. And after 
four, perhaps five months of not coming through on their word, community decided they were tired of waiting and just dipped into their own pockets, put that money up. So it really shows the commitment of these communities to say that we need water now. Uh, in addition to, of course, building the system themselves with uh, supervision from Altropico, the community also elected a water committee, right? Elected a, a board of five, six members who are going to be responsible for this system over the first couple of years and will need to be reelected consistently if they're going to continue managing it. They set bylaws that will govern the use of the system. <clears throat> and the water committee oversaw a lot of that work while at the same time participating in training that would allow them or will allow them to continue running the system well in the future. So what has that reached? Right. Those of you who have seen the documentary can uh, observe where we were in mm, October, November when we filmed those those usage scenes. And here we are six months later and it continues to work well. So we've got a system that's providing potable water, it's providing water that really meets Ecuadorian drinking water standards <laughs> to each of the approximately 110 households and institutions in Pichiyaku. Everyone has a meter at their house. Everyone is paying a base rate plus an extra if their consumption goes over what's defined as sort of the minimum. The system is being maintained and administered by the water committee. And the water source, right, we've had a period of both intense rains and fairly extended dry periods. The water source is holding up well, and the community's uh, multi-stage filtration system and chlorination is providing potable water. So pretty pleased with it, um, just sort of an an additional investment, right, and this is something that uh, people have already asked me about in the documentary. This photo in the lower right is unfortunately the first couple of days after we inaugurated the system. Within two weeks, the community had once again dipped into their pockets and built uh, fencing and a roof over the tanks to protect them from any kind of potential vandalism, right? So uh, a shame that we couldn't get that uh, better look on the tanks into the documentary, but really goes to show a um, just how efficient with funding Altropico is and b how willing the community is to really reinvest in the system. So going to the next, you know, a little bit the testimonial of the users. I know many of you have seen the film, but and Lorena is a really fantastic board member, a really fantastic leader of her community. But in other ways, very representative of the boards that we have in other communities, right? Folks who are proud to be there building their systems and then are really, you know, making this paradigm change in their communities happen and yeah. maintaining these systems over the long term. <laughs> so how do we sustain these systems in the future? Next slide, please. <laughs> Right, knowing that local government, other NGOs perhaps aren't going to provide the support we would want. A big part of our efforts are just focusing our, our efforts in these very limited regions, right? And that helps to develop a supportive environment. For one, it provides what's called the, the possibility of a circuit rider, which means you can have a sort of super technician visiting these communities <clears throat> on a regular basis, right? Helping people resolve technical administrative problems with their systems without the need of bringing someone in from the outside, right? Someone who really understands the context of the area and can develop these, these relationships with board members by visiting them on a regular basis and help them solve not just the simple uh, technical issues, but also these thornier administrative or management issues that often crop up. An additional issue is, right, the Kayapas is very isolated, going from communities like Pichiyaku to the nearest major city, which has a sort of a good offer in terms of materials, is a six-hour one-way trip approximately, two, two and a half hours on a canoe, and then another three and a half more or less on a bus. So imagine making a 12-hour round trip to buy a $2 part. So another one of the efforts we've had, our administrator here in uh, Sapayo Grande is opening a co-op hardware store specializing in selling materials for these water systems. They've branched out into selling materials for household sanitation, but we've really seen this to be uh, very advantageous in terms of ensuring high quality fixes rather than jerry-rigged ones for these systems. <clears throat> 
And finally, we're doing a lot of real-time support. We have a WhatsApp group that is consistently active. We have something in the neighborhood of 50 participants representing not only the systems along the Kayapas, but those elsewhere in Ecuador. And we're often getting questions ranging anywhere from how would you recommend resolving this dispute with a user about their water meter to how many centimeters of the slow sand filter do we need to strip if we're going to do a six month cleaning. <clears throat> in addition, knowing the turnover of these water committees is a real issue. We're doing continuous training for new members and refresher training for existing members, both through uh, sort of ad hoc training that we can fund through individual projects, but additionally through the water school that is being supported through the Ministry of Environment that Anthropico has been running in other regions of the country for several years and is now running the Kayapas. <clears throat> additionally, we're working very slowly, but this is a, a long range goal on improved governance in the area and really seeing if we can attract local government investment into keeping these systems up. And Altropico's big strategy for this has been to develop a watershed council that brings communities together to try to deal with not only the issues of drinking water access, but as these communities are living in such sort of close communion with the Cayapas River, <clears throat> figuring out how other issues on contamination can be resolved at the county and even uh, larger than county level at the Cayapas Basin reaches out into neighboring areas. And finally, this regional approach, of course, helps us keep costs down, right? Concentrating these systems, using local technicians, local promoters that Altropico has, and at the end of the day, being able to move, some, in some cases, materials from one community to another <clears throat> has really helped keep, one, external costs down, and two, created this body of evidence for local communities to say, yes, we're willing to invest out of pocket. Yes, we're willing to invest these funds we have from Socio Bosque. <clears throat> and where do we go from here? Next slide, please. Pichiaku continues to function well, and now we're moving on to sort of parallel lines of work, <clears throat> one of which is the Middle River Campus Regional Project, which is taking a gravity-fed source at an elevation about 450 meters above the communities inside the Kolokache Kayapas National Park. Bringing water from that source nine kilometers overland to a central high point. <clears throat> and from there, taking that crude water, taking that water without a lot of pretreatment, and distributing it to provide this sort of consistent source to nine community run water systems with a total population of about 2,000. So this is a sort of technical solution in, on the one hand to contamination of the Rio Cayapas and the uh, Rio San Miguel. On the other hand, it's a big uh, management challenge and one that communities have enthusiastically embraced on the idea that this will be a system that will require co-management, will require the collaboration between both Afro-Ecuadorian and Chachi communities in the area, and then will require a fairly complex management system in order to maintain this long extension of pipelines and this intake located in areas of very difficult access, <clears throat> areas that are very jungly. We can get the next slide. I can illustrate a little bit. <clears throat> Still lagging here. Not sure if anyone else can see the next slide. Fantastic. So, Look at this roadmap. The Cayapas Basin is located in this big roadless area in the on the right hand side of that leftmost Google image. Got a little satellite photo, so you can really see that the land that's cleared out is really only around the river. That once you get more than 500 meters, perhaps off the river, you're back into forest, intervene forest, but forest nonetheless. <clears throat> and so the idea of the regional system is that it's going to bring water from the off screen almost on the lower right where it says Ruta Salta Bravo, all the way to this high point in the center of the circle. And then from the center of that circle, it's going to distribute to these nine communities that are within the circle. So really trying to find a solution to both the lack of stable water sources in the area and to the area's very uh, doubtful or very in unstable electrical grid. So pumping from the sources that are located and then filtering it 
is not a great option in these communities. And we think that this gravity feed option is a winner. What else are we doing at the same time? Working on coverage. Next slide, please. It's coming. Working on additional great. Working on additional coverage in the same parish that uh, Pichiaco is located in. So working in the main communities there in San Jose de Cayapa. Working in the main communities in the next parish up, which is Atahualpa, and really striving to hit that more than 50% coverage level, right? Some of you may see have seen our or will see our upcoming update on the work in Playa Grande. So between Playa Grande, which is around the river bend from Pichiaco, and Pichiaco itself, we're going to be hitting that 50% goal for San Jose de Cayapas. <clears throat> and we're looking to roll that work out in Tatahualpa. At the same time, the El Nino pattern has caused some serious flooding, both in the Cayapas and in southern Esmeraldas and Huizme. So we're looking to do some emergency repairs and sort of disaster preparedness operations with those systems. <clears throat> And finally, another NGO is tentatively making an entry into water work in the Cayapas. We're very excited about this, right? We need more ha all hands on deck for this work. And so Altropico is doing uh, quite a lot to support the creation of water committees in the communities where CEDU, this organization, will be funding a little bit of infrastructure work. And as we complete the regional system and some of the work in Atahualpa and San Jose Cayapas, We'll also be looking to revisit those communities and sort of up-level the systems that Segu is capable of building right now in order to bring them into line with what Green Empowerment and Altropico's general model is. Right now, they're budget limited, but we look we see very um, promising things in terms of community readiness to implement those systems, even if they're a little bit more basic than we would perhaps like. So... Really appreciate everyone, and of course, happy to take questions, both from this presentation and, of course, uh, from anything that you all have observed in the documentary. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam. I was so excited to, to review this presentation um, because even having reported a lot on this project in the last year, there were like really exciting new updates that I read through when reviewing the presentation. So. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like we already have a couple questions for you in the chat. Um, it looks like Narishma Kumar has a question. Maybe you could chime in here. I don't quite understand the question. It says, could you post uh -huh. yeah, email? It, yeah, go for it. Yeah, uh, so, uh, uh, Sam, uh, this is Kumar. Uh, we met several years back in Portland. You know, I was a volunteer mm -hmm. G. Your question is, uh, you know, I don't think you can answer it quickly because probably a lengthy answer, definitely a lengthy answer. Uh, what did you do to process the water or clean the water? You know, you get the river water, you know, wherever place you store, uh, and then you're going to uh, to process it before it gets piped to the houses or schools and such. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you do that is simple? You know, because uh, the stuff that I was researching on MSG is pretty expensive and costly, and, you know, we had to go around the country to beg for stuff, Uh and I don't think it would have worked really well because, you know, if something breaks down, the local people would not be able to fix it, you know. So I'd like to hear that, you know, I I defer my the response, you know, you can, you can send me an email or post it on GE website or something. Uh, I'm very curious to know as an engineer what you did that made it so easy and practical for the local communities to to do the work so clear you know, so well and so support themselves also them by themselves mm -hmm. sure and i think we can i can offer at least a, a brief response to this since i see that dave is also asking something related mm -hmm. so the river water coming off the kayapas we don't really see as treatable at the community scale right i think that in particular the issues with potential heavy metals contamination the sort of mm -hmm unpredictable frequency of that uh, of when that contamination is happening makes that uh, too steep of a hill to climb. Okay. Where we have communities that have larger surface water sources, what we've done is really upsize the storage tanks to allow them to pump during periods of lower turbidity and then doing multi-stage filtration. So roughing filters, slow sand filters, chlorination. Okay. And during high turbidity periods, hopefully, using the uh, 
just using larger tank to sort of bide our time. In mm. systems like Chiaku, where we do have a gravity source, right? This is a surface water source, but with a watershed of, I don't know, maybe 100 acres, 50 hectares. So quite small. Uh, turbidity peaks are limited. And so there we're applying that same system of dynamic filter, roughing filters, slow sand filters, chlorination. Uh, and effectively, it's it's not that easy for the community. It's a lot of time. So we're taking advantage of low labor costs and a lot of dedication from community members because that's the only thing we've seen as being feasible to operate at this community scale, right? Okay, um, yeah. <clears throat> some communities are, are paying a relatively good uh, wage is not exactly the right word, but a relatively good kind of recognition to their technicians to keep those systems up. Others are really depending on the um, personal dedication, sort of the, the volunteerism of their technicians to keep it up. Those of you who have seen the documentary, uh, Belsi is keeping that very small system of hers up for, I think, $30, $40 a month. So a labor of love, certainly, for many of our technicians. And to answer Dave's question, uh, while that water will be untreated as the central, or barely treated as the central point, each individual system will have one of these uh, multi-stage treatment plants, right? The idea is that keeping that kind of infrastructure up in the middle of the uh, the forest is going to be quite tough. So you want to bring the area that's going to require weekly attention, if not more frequent, much closer to communities and leave the stuff that can be attended to maybe once a month uh, back in the woods. Great questions. We'd love to open the floor now to see, um, are there other questions that have come up for folks? Hey, Sam, this is Harrison. Nice to hear your voice. Um, was asked, was wondering what was the, when we came and visited, I think in 2018, which community on the river Kayapa did we visit? And I recall that there was a major push for, um, oil palm plantations along the river. And I wondered if that was still an issue. And then the, the other question was, is that that large scale project, um, I'm just glad you highlighted just the, the issues around the coordination and management of that, because that's, that's just a whole nother level of complexity and ambition, but also just gonna congratulate you on, you know, being a part of that and, and, and trying to make that work. Good to hear from Harrison as well. Um, flipping the question a little bit, the regional system, yes, I think that were this a partner that wasn't anthropic, but were this an organization that didn't have as, as many years of experience working with these communities on other fairly uh, thorny issues of conservation and uh, land access, I think we might not have moved forward on something quite as complex as this regional system, but we uh, really been impressed by Anthropico's ability to negotiate with communities. And I think that between that and the technical justification of it, we're, we're moving full steam ahead with this system and communities are backing it to the hills. In 2018, I think because of the security situation, we didn't visit any of the communities on the Kayapas. We visited these communities in Muisne, in southern Esmeraldas which also required uh, canoe access at that point, right, in the rainy season. And oil palm continues to be a, a sort of a pressing uh, threat to surface water sources in that area. So what we've done is really look for sources with much smaller watersheds where there's no oil palm, at least directly being cultivated, although there may be some blowover from pesticides. There's a new report out about uh, what, well, fairly new report out about the six million people in Ecuador that live in areas with high pesticide applications. So definitely something at the front of our minds right now. In the Cayapas, um, at least upstream, we're not seeing a lot of large-scale agriculture just because of how difficult it is to get products out of the area. Right, the lack of road access there really does limit um, limit what's being cultivated, and we're seeing more of the issues being around 
mining where there are roads that can only be sort of transversed if you have a tracked excavator or something like it. Got it. Thank you. Of course. All right. We probably have time for at least two more questions if there are other folks who want to chime in. Or I'll ask a question I have. I have a question. Joaquin, tell us Hello. what you're thinking. Hi, good to see you. Yes, Look good to beard. see you guys. <laughs> I got my beard out and everything, yeah. Beautiful. So happy to be invited for this. I'm so glad to see you guys and hear you. Um, my question was, uh, I want to hear more about this new partner. Oh, Sedu. So this is the... Uh, Ecumenical Commission for Human Rights. So not a partner per se, but we're sort of seeing Aldropico pay it forward in this case, right? They've found this organization who's been working again on, on government since you might imagine human rights in the Kayapas for a couple of years and have now mm, perhaps unexpectedly found themselves with a project that has a water aspect and rather than flail about with that on their own asked Altropico for support and Altropico has been um, sort of very dedicated in putting in time and putting in guidance for this organization so that they can uh, spend their limited budget in the most effective way possible. So if things go well with them perhaps we can consider in a couple of years whether we would also take up work with Sedu. But for the moment, we're sort of backstopping El Tropico when they have technical uh, consultations about the systems they're designing for Sedu. Great. Thanks, Sam. <clears throat> All right. Anyone else want to jump in before I ask my question? I think Michelle's got a, a good one for you there, Micah. Oh, I didn't see. Yeah, Michelle. Uh, where can we watch the film? A question for me. Streaming somewhere? It's not streaming yet. Um, we're waiting. We're holding off on on having it available to stream um, until we have gotten accepted to various film festivals because many film festivals will not show your film in, if it's available online. Um, I'll kind of say to this internal group, like um, if you very much want to see it and you're not going to be able to make it to any of our showings, send me an email and we can see if we can work something out. Also, I was just talking with Andrea today about making it available to our kind of core supporters. If you want to have like show it in your home to a group of friends or at your community center, kind of as a um, house party package. So this is a new idea on the books um, for this fall after the official premiere. We want to make that available to, to you folks and to our core supporters first um, to, to really be using it to, to show to our networks and show to our friends. Um, so I'm the person to ask about that. Send me an email. Um, any word on which festivals you're targeting? Yeah, so far um, we've been applying mostly to things in the North well, we applied to the Climate Festival in New York City, which is happening right before New York Climate Week. And then we've applied to several in the Northwest here, including the Bend Film Festival, the um, Port Townsend Film Festival, and the Gorge Film Festival, mostly because those are the opportunities that we've gotten, that we've been sent, <laughs> and we knew the deadlines were coming up. And now we're kind of doing a more strategic um take at like looking at all film festivals across the country and prioritizing so if you do have recommendations or ones you think we should definitely be in please email them to us because we're really doing more of a vetting process now um yeah we also applied to one down in the bay area uh any final questions for sam before we let him go I'll ask one question I'm super curious about, Sam. I was really excited. This was the first I'd heard about the circuit writer, which was the technician that will be, or maybe the technician that already exists to, to go to different communities. Is that mm -hmm. part of Hamil's role or is that a separate role? For the moment, it's part of Hamil's role. This is Hamil Nazareno is Altropico's community promoter. 
but he's also the former president and technician of his own community's water system. So a lot of practical experience to go with what he's getting now in the organizing and on the design side with Altropico. In the future, uh, we would love to see this role being something that is supported by the Watershed Council, right? We would like to see this role live outside of Altropico in order to make it as local as possible, in order to ideally uh, provide it with a little bit more sustainability, right? I've, I've seen successful implementations of this model elsewhere with municipal government support. I think we're still many moons away from that kind of, of investment by municipal government in the Kayapas. Mm, great. So the Watershed Council, is that municipal or is that another organization? That's sort of uh, super community, right? What's called a man mm. here. And so mm. that would involve representatives of local governments, parish, municipal, and province level, um, but also involve a lot of community leaders. Great. Okay. Thank you, Sam. All right. I think with that, we're going to wrap up our kind of group session for the for the evening. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really fun to have this conversation with board and tech members and some staff members on the call. And let's give you can actually unmute yourself for a second and just say wonderful things to Sam. Applaud. We really appreciate your time. Ooh. It's way after hours in Ecuador. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sam. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thanks. Eat, you up, eat up well from your root canal or whatever you had. <laughs> If you're on the associate board, don't sign off. I should have said that first. <laughs> Stay if you're on the associate board. We're going to have our meeting now. But everyone else, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Cool.